This conference will now be recorded. Hi, this is Bill O'Brien, Ninth District Councilman, Chairman of the Parks and Rec Committee, calling to order the meeting of March 2nd at 6 p.m. Can I have an approval of the minutes for February 2nd? Um, I've read through them. I hope everybody has had a chance to look through them. If uh, I'll make a motion to approve them. This is Rick Marcone. Drew Boddington will second the motion. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, Chad, you're up. All right. I mean, I, I know you have an agenda, but I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, can we bring this up as new business or do you want to wait or what do you want to do? No, why don't you do it as part of your report? Okay. Um, so we've been looking at a bunch of different playgrounds. Obviously, you know, some of the playgrounds are starting to get older in that 2007, 2006, 2008 range in that 15 year. And Bird's Eye Complex once uh, is one of those playgrounds where, you know, it's looking to be replaced. Um, and, you know, I worked with uh, Game Time. They showed me this new concept that came from like Denmark. Uh, it's called YALP, Y-A-L-P, Play Backwards, and an anagram. Um, so they started this interactive playground, which is very handicap accessible, um, children of all ages. It's not targeted to a specific group. So the playground that's at Bird's Eye right now is from two to five, two-year-old to five-year-olds. So now if you look at this playground or this image that I have in front of you, it could be used for young adults, adults, teens, kids, toddlers. Um, it's really interactive and there's different ways to control the software. So it changes the levels, the kind of games that are played. Um, everything can be controlled by a computer, by somebody, by an administrator. Um, so this is the, you know, this is just a rendition of in that fenced in area at Bird's Eye. And we're looking at these two apparatuses. The archway is called a Sono, and this uh, pillar system is called the Mimo. So if you guys have time to YouTube uh, Yelp play systems or Yelp uh, Sono or Yelp Mimo, you'll see how they do lights and games and like tag and capture the flag with lights. Um, they're very, very neat. So we had talked to them about doing this in town. Um, it is, these are very expensive. Um, it's a very expensive playground, but if you take into a fact that, you know, a new playground there with a poor in place surface would almost be 100, 115,000. And then 10 years later or 15 years later, you would have to replace it again. Um, the cost kind of evens it out because these are around 200 to 250,000. But your target is bigger. Your market is bigger. Um, with Amy, I've talked with Amy about this too, who's on this call of programs, youth programs, uh, community center, um, different interaction, kids. Um, so this is something that I want to bring to you guys. And if you had any questions or you see that this would, plus there is no Yelp playground in the state of Connecticut yet. I think Hartford is trying to put one in, um, in their system and their park systems, but that's about it. So it would be extremely be unique uh, to, the, to this part of the country. There's some out in the Midwest. There's one down in Jersey that I know of, but kind of in this local community, it would be kind of a big buzz. What's um, the so life expectancy on these? These are supposed to be 25, 25 years because as the software has changed, you could upgrade the electronics with the software. So, and this is built in Norway and Denmark. Um, these both companies, I mean, I, I wish if I had more time, I would have showed you the whole video on how they started, but they start in inclement, they, you know, this company started in inclement weather it's not like it was started in california or arizona or florida like this is you know snow country in denmark and norway and they have extreme success you know they're they're tamper proof i mean nothing is fully you know absolved to vandalism but they are you know tamper proof they're very easy they're you know all you need to do is put power to them and everything is controlled from that computer link and link up
but if if we wanted to pursue this or kind of go you know the pricing that i have is from 2022 obviously now it's 23 so i have to do i would have to do all kinds of new pricing see what the monies are see what cip we would have to go for um and if this is you know if this something like this is not put you know i think it's a perfect location for this type of playground um you know, to start off with uh compared to like a long brook or a short beach or something like that because you have the youth you know that you, you have the community center there which is definitely more you know a very busy place a very busy hub chad are you looking at this year's cip or next year uh, that would be up to the director, you know, because I know I have some existing money, but I don't know. It would be up to her to figure it out. And I don't think we've submitted our CIPs yet, but obviously I would have to go, you know, with a recommendation from you guys to kind of pursue this, uh, we would, you know, see all funding, uh, funding sources. Hey, Chad, hey, Chad how long does it take to install something like that? I would say probably like a normal playground. I mean, a playground is like three weeks once the material comes in. It would be very similar. The only thing is we would have to, you know, there's there's electric that go to that field. So getting the electric there, I don't think would be all that hard. And then just the material, you know, so it wouldn't be, it would be a little bit different than a, than a playground. A playground is a little bit easier to install, but not, not by much. Chad, does it Chad, need internet up. access or just electricity? I'm sorry, what? It does, does not need internet. Does no. not. I like no. the idea, but I guess this question would be maybe for Amy. Do you think two to five year old parents will not like it? They'd rather have a traditional one for those little kids. Well, I mean, you I can play all of I the games. Like I think, and then I can also get um, Magda involved from the, you know, she handles a lot of the younger play groups and stuff. Um, that she runs them at Bird's Eye. She's with Parent Place. Um, but Chad and I talked about it, and I I love the idea. Yeah, it'd be great for your summer programs too. Not to be a naysayer, and I think it's a great idea, but how rugged is this thing? Because these kids up here are a hell of a lot rougher on stuff than kids in Norway are. <laughs> They're concrete <laughs> structures. <laughs> And I, I'm talking about the other, like that, like the, the yellow um, arc. How, how tall is that thing? Uh, I, I know an adult could fit under it, so I think it's over six foot tall. I think it's right around six foot or over six foot tall. And, and, and Chad, I'm assuming the blue area is probably that padded material, is it, or is it yeah, concrete? The whole, the whole blue would be a pour in place rubber, so that it's completely accessible to wheelchairs, uh, young kids uh, falling. If you slip and fall or fall, it would be the squishy type core and play playground material. Hey Chad, it's Paul. Do you have to have someone on uh, on site to change, you know, if you get a group of like three or four year olds or a group of seven or eight year olds, do they have to change the uh, programming then? No, it would it would have to just be set up a way. So if you're targeting a specific group for like a program, say Amy has, you know, teens that want to use it or something as a program, capture the flag, then you could set it for that. Uh, but then you could set it as a random, you know, just an intermediate level, beginner level, advanced level. So you could keep it just plain and simple, you know, for whatever your target is. But it's not accessible at the site. It's only accessible on that computer or through the programming. Can you uh, put on a timer? So it'd be, you know, yes. two to five so, during the school day. Yeah, it would, be the, it would be the same thing as like the Splash Park. You know, it would have an open window of operation and then it would shut down by power at 8 p.m., 10 p.m., 9 p.m., 4 p.m., however you wanted to do it. But can you also change it so it's two to four year olds during the school day and then at you know three thirty or three o'clock it changes to the five to twelve year old? That I don't know. I would have to ask the company or research the actual programming more. I'm not sure about that. Good question though. I could find out. I think I think it's a great idea to be able to have something that's flexible for all the age groups. But they really do like it. You know, even the, the older kids like to have something to be able to find and play with. It's just a matter of uh 
yeah, how how user friendly it actually is once it's installed. Let me see if I could get a video. <laughs> Go faster on more devices with Optima Fiber Internet. Does everybody see this? Yeah. Yes. So far. Yep. Yeah. Like they're going to McDonald's. Rick, can you mute your computer, please? Well, I guess, Tim, that answers our question. I guess it is user interactive. Maybe it's changed over the years since I first started researching it. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is the MIMO. Chad, would we keep that triangle fence around it? I mean, obviously near yes. the side, but the the other yeah. part of the field. Yeah, we would keep we would keep the perimeter fence, and then basically right now there's a depression in the sidewalk that would be all flat pour and place rubber with these two pieces of uh, apparatus in it. So I mean, that gives you kind of an idea of what it what it does and what it's about. Um, you know, I. I I was impressed. I thought it was amazing, you know, just kind of uh, the different, you know, because playgrounds are so targeted. You know, if you do a five to 12, then, you know, toddler parents are so bummed that they can't bring their because there's climbing features and not safety. And then you have two to five and then, you know, the, the platforms are so low. And when you get a five and 12 year old kid that goes to a two to five playground, they're almost jumping off roofs, roofs and, you know, that's just the, the two apparatuses aren't really played correctly where this gives you interactive it talks to you um it's it's an interactive voice uh and stuff like that so you know just uh maybe the wave of the future of how things are going um if you look at if you google like the the playground that they did at jersey um it is completely handicapped and there's like inbound uh bouncies and trampolines and um swings and rope lines and uh all kinds of different stuff that's uh and these yelp things too so it's pretty neat it's uh it's pretty nice it's just pricey you know if you look at it it's pricey but uh you know i wanted to present to you guys to see if you're for this if you see a need for our community to have something like this yeah, my only oh, chad how much do you estimate black. how much more do you estimate over the traditional playground it's probably about a, I mean, conservatively, a hundred and seventy thousand dollars more. No, maybe not that much. It's a hundred fifty. It's about two. So about a hundred and twenty grand more than a traditional playground. But you know, Bird's Eye Playground was replaced or added in two thousand eight. So at fifteen years old, it needs to be replaced. I think in 2008, it was about 48,000, 42,000, something like that, if the records were right. And our new playground that we're looking at is 110, you know, for the same area, same size. So just right there is almost 150 grand in 15 years, where if you do this, it's got a little bit lower longevity, you know, longevity is there, um, age group is there, bigger markets there, so it kind of, you know, touches more bases for the money that they're charging. 
And you know, the last quote I got, it was, if I could move this over. So this was in March of, ironically, oh my God, almost the, almost the same day. <laughs> uh, March 4th in 2022, the 35,000 is the installation price and the actual equipment is 159. So it's right around 200 grand. So not much more, $80,000 more than what a traditional playground would cost. That's a year pricing, I mean, if you add 20% to it, so maybe it's 220, you know, somewhere in there. But and you don't know yet long. what uh, you have left in that account. You said you have some money left over. I do, yes. And uh, one of, you know, one of the playgrounds we were going to look to replace was Bird's Eye Complex. So that's why if I talk with the director, um, see if there's any other available monies or asking for for CIP this year, uh, whatever the case is, you know, funding this project or going to this project would be, you know, in the forefront to get done because most of the money is there. Chad, is there a cost for the upgrading of the program whenever it needs to get upgraded or if there's any problems with the system, what's, the, what's that cost? That I don't know. I mean, talking with the game time reps and stuff, I, I would have to find that out. This was only just preliminary talk, so... I'm not sure how upgrades or additions go, if it's just automatically sent, if there's actual modules that you buy. That's all stuff that I could research and bring back um, as we get deeper into this. But yeah, that's a very good question. It's a great, it's a great system. I'd love to see it. It's awesome. But I wonder if there's more costs down the road for it. They make a, a whole slew of things that I was, uh, you know, showing Bill in my office. Like they make kick panels for soccer balls. They make like little goals with floor hockey, like a, like a deck hockey kind of setup. Um, they make uh, DJ booths, like concrete DJ booths, what you could hook your phone to and mix and scratch. Like this whole Yelp line is pretty amazing and it's made to be outdoor. It's made to weather extreme weather, snow, freezing temperatures and all of that stuff. And, you know, it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. Like it's, uh, it's uh, getting more and more popular. Like I said, in the Midwest, the West Coast, in this middle of this, you know, country, Midwest, it's kind of popping up and not really here in the Northeast yet. But I would imagine once people start seeing these and the benefits that they'll start to transition especially how expensive playgrounds are getting these days. Well, you Bill, know, I think cost. we should tell Chad to continue um, to, to pursue this. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, that's why I, I was thinking um, maybe get some of that other information and we talk about next um, month. I was just going to text Renee to see if she knows when the CIP um, budget has to be. I don't think that gets done till later. I think the, the main budget is the primary focus right now. Yeah, usually start meeting soon with the CIP request. So I'll make sure to talk to her if you want to bring it up to her, you know, Bill, that's fine. Yeah. And then I'll find out as much information as I can for the next meeting. I wrote yeah. down all your guys' questions so I could find out from the actual, you know, from game time from our distributor about it. You know, that's, they're all great questions that I didn't think of. All right, so that's we something to plan. Should we put this under old business for next month? Sure. Why don't we do that, Aileen? Thanks. Chad, any upgrade on the um, lighting projects? No, they still have it works because of the, the uh, temperatures and 90% of their access point now is on the field and the grass area. So they still haven't done anything. I was going to give them one more week to kind of see. We knew kind of snow was coming this week, but starting Monday, I'm going to be calling them and finding out what their timeline is because obviously the ground is probably not going to freeze at this point the way that they're hoping. So they're going to have to do all kinds of provisions to protect the grass, whether that's plywood, uh, plastic, you know, sheeting, 
whatever it is, you know, by contract, they have to protect the grass. So I'm going to find out on Monday what's going on, what their plans are, what their timeline is and what their schedule is. And I could certainly send an email out to, you know, Aileen to, you know, share with the uh, commission. But I haven't heard anything since they had to pull out because it was just too soft. They couldn't work. Chad, how much do they have done? Not much at all. You know, there's only, there's very limited they do on the outside of where the pavement is compared to all of the stuff that's on the inside grass. Um, so they started and did what they did, but they couldn't do anything more. So like I said, I'll just follow up with them, find out a timeline, find out where they are, find out what the plan is now, because now they don't have a choice with hard ground and all of that stuff. They're going to have to go to plan B. Anything else that you had on your report before we had a couple other questions? Yeah, sure. I just, uh, Amy and I talked earlier, we're just kind of looking at the whole inventory for fields and all of that stuff. And we noticed across the, probably the last six years, five, six years, the back field on Lincoln Street, not the front field by the school, because we obviously use that for men's softball. And it's been a great addition for you know them to use. But that back field in the wood line uh, we were thinking about removing the backstop and just changing it back to grass just because there's no permits on it. It's not really used. It'll give us more grass area for a larger box field if we need it. Um, and it just gives us some opportunity plus something that we don't have to groom and maintain if it's really not being utilized. So if that was okay with the, you know, the commission to kind of present that and transitioning it away from a baseball field and transitioning it just back to grass. Uh, we're just asking if that's okay. You talk about the one over by that is to the up against uh, Nichols Avenue. Yeah, the one that's closest to Nichols. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I mean, speaking from soccer, I, I practice on that field every week in the fall and spring. There's a lot of practices out there, and more grass would be really beneficial to all those practices that are using those those areas. So we've got usually four practices just on that one side at once. So it'd be great yeah, but I think, I think we do two medium sized fields on that side, but maybe we could extend them out. Uh, maybe we could add a third field, you know, utilizing it back to grass and removing it would open up, even a small soccer field would open up some possibilities. Sure. Yeah, even just to have, but, you know, that, that but Chad, lines are great, the, grass is a great start. Doesn't doesn't that get used during the season though? I see people practicing baseball and stuff there all the time on that field. Maybe maybe uh -huh. they don't have games there, but there's practices there like crazy. Hey Paul, um, I, yeah. I don't permit that field at all for baseball or softball at Worcester. The only field used at Worcester is the softball field closest to where the basketball hoops are, the outdoor hoops. That far one that he's talking about. Oh, uh, oh, I thought it was the close one. I'm sorry. No, no, the, the, no the one in the woods, kind of. The one in the woods. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Yep. No, yeah, you're right. I don't see anybody down there. Yeah, once in, a, once in a while, there are people there. It's not like nobody's there, but I don't think well, it gets used a ton. And it's, if it's obviously not being permitted, it's just pick up stuff and, you know, people just going down there. And I think that tells the story best with the permits. So seems like a good idea to me. Okay. You want somebody to make a motion on that? Or do, or do you even need that? You just need uh, our agreement. I don't think I need a motion. I just think, you know, as long as the commission is behind it, seeing that it's not really permitted, it's not really utilized, um, it's basically an extra sandlot field, which could be transitioned into something different, then that's all. Just, you know, if people are asking, it was brought to the commission, it's not really permitted, it's not used, so it's transitioning into a, a more grass field or, a, you know, a flat grass field that could be utilized better for soccer, Sterling House, or what have you, you know? Did you hear back from anybody about Chapel, about that field being removed? No, not one nothing, thing. Nothing, no. Nothing. Not, nobody said boo. 
All right, I'm good with it. I did, I, Amy and I did get a question. I don't think if it was because the field was removed or can we put a full size field in that front area and the back area now that it's grass or with the openness and you can't, it's not big enough, but that was the one question we got. Anybody have any opposition to the idea? No, I'm good with it. No. Nope. All right, Chad, sounds good. That's all really I have, you know, just winter was really soft, so we were able to get into a lot of different parks and playgrounds and, uh, you know, cleaning stone walls and cleaning tree areas and kind of tightening up a lot of stuff. So you'll notice there's some difference in coming into the spring in some parks where we were able to get some work done with no snow on the ground. So, you know, we were excited about that. So Chad, would you know anything about the the gate at Bunnell that goes down to the baseball field? You know the new gate that was put in and why it's locked all the time? Are you talking about the driveway gate or the baseball gate? The baseball gate, the pedestrian the gate. Um, the athletic director had asked it to be locked all the time. So what, are they just open it when there's baseball games or practice? Pretty much, either if it's permitted or when Benali uses it. Ken, you were thinking it should be open all the time? Yeah, I mean, every, every field in town is accessible all the time. And people, people have been um, wondering why they have to go down the big hill and they walk all the way over to the baseball field. And, you know, we went and put that pedestrian gate in there. And I think it should be open all the time, just like the back of Benel is open. The big hill gate is open and that hill should be open. I don't understand what that's accomplishing. That's fine with me. So we'll open it. We'll open it tomorrow. Not a problem. You might want to, you might want to I, talk to Wayne and make sure there's nothing that they've got open that they don't want people to get to first before we make sure he's got it locked up, everything locked up right. Gary, Gary, the field is wide open. You could walk in the other hill. You could walk in the back gate. Benel is wide open. It's wide open. There's yep, kids. Just, there. just saying, but it's all. There's kids down yeah, there all the time, all the time. I don't know how this happened, but I did see, and I did email chat about this morning that uh, some teens have gotten into that baseball field on Tuesday during the snowstorm and carried a uh, very long, I don't know, 16, 20 foot um, uh, bench from the, looked like from the uh, dugout all the way up to the outfield and tried to put it over the fence. Uh, up until I yelled at them to stop because they're about to destruct a lot of property. So, I mean, that, you know, you can't stop people <laughs> that want to do dumb things. They're going to find a way to do dumb things. But they somehow got in there. It's very easy to get in there because the back gate is open and the big hill gate is open. The vanilla is totally wide open. So locking one of the three gates accomplishes nothing. I guess we should probably tell Wayne that somebody did that so he can get the benches that are unlocked put them away yeah so I, told, I told again. tim i told tim i'm gonna have building maintenance look at it and see if they can secure the benches by chain so if they could be removed that easily then they need to better be secured either to the wall or to a pole or a post so we'll i'll have okay. building maintenance take a look at it and see how to secure it properly tim how many kids were carrying those those benches are heavy it was a uh, three teens were doing it. I mean, they were in the snow, so they must, I didn't see the first half. I only saw them getting out the outfield. They dragged it out. And then their thought was to make a seesaw over the fence, over the uh, home run fence. I it was a huge, it was very long. And that's why they struggled so much with it. And it was, you know, starting to bend. And <laughs> if it was that, I, you know, I, I see, see all the dollars starting to add up in my head. If it was that heavy, could it have damaged the field if they were dragging it? Uh, I think at that point there was still enough snow on the field. No, I don't think so. I'm sure it didn't. 
And how lucky was it that you saw it and said something? <clears throat> yeah, that I told them that they're, you know, going to call the police for destruction of property. And they said, the response was, we're not destructing their property. I said, you, you will be if you don't stop right now. And then they thought about it and they, and they stopped. So and they but just yeah, dropped you know, it there. A, yeah. You would have had, you know, would have had a broken 20 foot bench, would have had a broken home run fence, would have had a broken, uh, you know, the yellow, you know, the top of the fence, it would have been, you know, <laughs> and you know, a month or two, you know, a month and a half to get it fixed. Chad, any update on the golf course and when do you plan to open this year? Uh, I mean, the golf course was looking good. We put the two turf covers on them and opening is probably not going to happen until at least the last week of March or until the first week of April. Um, good Friday is April 7th this year. So it's a little bit later than in March. Uh, but, you know, we want to keep those turf covers on as uh as long as we can so that we get some good spring growth with the heating you know underneath those thermal covers so that we get some you know recovery and recuperation from some of the you know weaker areas that were produced from last year um i don't really have a date yet because i'm waiting for all of the seasonal staff the return staff to go through their process of hiring so until i get the okay that those they could be utilized which takes about two weeks thereabouts so you know, we started that process uh, about a week ago, so I'm waiting till mid-March until they kind of get cleared, and then we'll kind of see what the weather wet weather patterns are for then, and then go from there. All right, thanks. Anybody have anything else for Chad? Uh, this is Catherine. I just want to uh, thank Chad and uh, his guys. Um, they came over to Sterling House and the uh, Civic Plaza to the library in Baldwin and, and cleaned up a whole bunch of stuff. Like he was saying with the parks, he cleaned up everything around the cemetery, everything behind buildings, in front of buildings. Um, his crew did a really nice job cleaning up that whole area from Baldwin down to Sterling House. So thank you, Chad. Oh, our pleasure. It was a long time coming. <laughs> Well, that's taking advantage of the uh, winter, nice winter weather. I hope it's okay. a one and done. All right, thanks, Chad. Amy, are you ready? I am ready. Are you ready? We are ready. Good. All right. Um, not too much different from last month. Um, we're finishing up our winter programs and starting to promote our spring programs, which majority of them will be outdoors. Um, we switch gears, we go to football and track and archery, um, working with the Stratford High School wrestling team. Um, they would like to do a wrestling program for youth in town and Stratford High School Athletic Director Tony um, is kind enough to let us use Stratford High School because of the wrestling mats. We don't really have those. We can't buy those. They're very expensive. Um, and I'm sure some of you know, maybe you've seen it. Uh, James Tuhansik, who is a rec kid who works for us, won the state championship, uh, the whole CIAC. So he is going to be running the program for the um, high school coach, and the high school coach will be there to oversee it. But we're really excited about it. We're going to start promoting it um, in the next, probably next week, uh, and hopefully get some kids to come out and get involved in wrestling kind of behind um, James and his big victory. Uh, we're starting to plan summer camps. Um, we are going to start opening it up for people to register on April 15th. Um, we're just giving a, Sterling House has a whole new computer system this year, and they've asked us to kind of hold off a little bit. So I have no problem doing that. Um, we normally open April 1st. It's not a big deal to wait till the 15th. So it gives me more time actually to put together our flyer and get everything out to, to folks. Um, adult spring volleyball is gonna start next week. Uh, we do a ladies league and a, an adult league co-ed. Um, I've opened up co-ed and men's softball registration. Um, that's gonna start in May. Um, we had a a lot of issues with the co-ed softball league on Sunday mornings. So I am planning to have um, 
a big meeting with the captains there and kind of come up with some zero tolerance policies because um, I don't want to deal with a lot of problems that we've had in the past. So hopefully that will take care of it for this spring. Um, we are working with both middle schools, Worcester and Flood, and the PTAs on um, a new musical, SpongeBob the Musical. Uh, rehearsals have begun. Kids are signing up. Um, that is going to be in April. The play will be held in late April. So we'll be promoting that. Um, tickets are going to be sold through both PTAs. Um, swimming is moving along. We're doing lessons at El Grasso. We're full. We're going to be starting lessons at Flood in a couple weeks. Um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, the YMCA is still using our pools. Um, they were supposed to be done, but now they've asked for an extension. I don't know what's going on with their pool in Milford, but apparently they need some, uh, it's not ready yet. So they are paying full price um, and covering all costs. So we're good with that. Um, indoor pickleball, we're into our last two months with residents, seems to be going very well. Heard too many problems, which is good. Um, working with Catherine and uh, Josh over at Sterling House to do our first um, ever pickleball tournament outdoors at Worcester. We're looking at April 15th as a date. Um, Sterling House is putting together a flyer and I'm putting it all together in rec desk. So hopefully next week you guys will see that be promoted and people will start registering for that. Um, we are accepting all applications now for our um, summer employment. We are doing two job fairs, one at Stratford High, one at Benell um, next week. Um, if you have any kids that are at Stratford High or Benell, all they need to do is fill out an application and show up that day with their application and we will interview them. Um, hopefully we're making it easier for the kids. Uh, the schools have been promoting it within the schools. So we're hoping to get a lot of kids. It's been very successful. We've been doing it since I started in rec. Um, Springfield requests, all of our local teams requests are in. So we're booking them, we're putting them on the fields. Uh, now I move on to the travel teams, but uh, we don't have a lot of fields left after our local teams have taken up um, all of our fields. But uh, if we do, we'll, we'll hook up the travel teams if we can. They all, all the travel teams pay for, you know, based on our athletic field policy, everything is covered, they all pay for it. Um, summer concerts, um, you know, with, with losing Ed, um, I kind of took over, but I did it a different way where I just kind of sent out a blanket email to all of our local Stratford bands on like a first come first serve basis. So by doing that, um, a couple of Stratford bands didn't make the cut, but I decided to extend the season this year. So instead of start, starting on June 29th, we're gonna start on June 13th. And I added two uh, Stratford bands to play um, so now our concert series is, is June 13th through August 29th. Um, beach stickers have been ordered. We're in the process of that, and I can get more into that with you all at a later time. But new stickers have come out um, in July tax breaks. Um, my budget has been submitted. Uh, you know, I'll find out if it gets approved or not. I won't know until obviously May. Um, and the big events that are coming up um, for this month, St. Patrick's Day event at Town Hall. And there's going to be a, some type of martial arts tournament at Stratford High School. It's involving um, Martin Chisholm, who has done a lot for the town. He works with Pal and he is uh, leasing out Stratford High School to do this event. Um, and obviously he's paying for everything. There'll be no cost to the town. And I guess I'm open for questions. Hey, Amy, on the, uh, the wrestling program, what ages will that serve? Uh, it's going to be ages uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, co-ed. Nice. And how about the, uh, the play? A, a, We're... Sorry, we also had a girl wrestler come in, I think, third place this year as oh, well. Nice. Yeah, the wrestling nice. at Stratford High is really taken off. And there's been a, a, a need for the youth program for years i know they've always talked about it but never got off the ground it always takes somebody with passion and this new coach um they call him coach tommy but that's not his real name I, his first name is something else um, <laughs> he's pretty passionate about it and he approached me and um you know it's nice when people work together so tony um from the high school was willing to let us use the school because of the whole because of the mats because they're very expensive and then the play, where will that be performed? 
Uh, the play, I believe, is going to be at Worcester in their auditorium. Um, and it's actually been a really nice joint venture. With uh, We started with just myself um, and Mitchell, who works for me, and the Worcester PTA. But when they asked me to get involved, they said we should open it up to everybody. So they reached out to the Flood PTA, and they were all on board. So it'll be a nice joint venture. Um, Mitchell had mentioned to me that they haven't really done a middle school play in a, in a long time. Sounds good. Anybody else have any questions? Hey, this is Prez. How y'all doing tonight? Hey, Amy, I just wanted to check in and see uh, how was the participation uh, and the success of uh, both the boys and the girls uh, basketball program this uh, term? Uh, the Travel Pal team, um, they've been doing well. Our girls team won their preseason tournament um, for the sixth grade girls, and I believe the Eighth grade boy, we have two eighth grade boys teams that are very successful, doing very well. Um, we are now in Hoop Fest, which is the end of the season tournament. And so far, it's going very well. Um, I actually received a compliment from the guy who runs the Milford League, uh, that the girls league that started with me, oh gosh, had to be four or five years ago, is really coming around. And the, the girls teams are are very successful and some of the better teams in the league. So um that that's really kudos to the coach robert dupree who volunteers his time and he does a great job with the kids so um so that's yeah they're doing great both both third are doing really well the participation is great we've had we have nine teams this year that are playing for pal so that's a lot that is outstanding to hear wonderful okay if there's nothing else We'll go on to continuing items. Longbrook tennis courts. I guess that will come up in CIP, I hope. You don't know anything about it, right, Chad, as far as how much the increase was? Sorry, Bill, I don't know. I have any information. Yeah, it's a shame that got stalled, but hopefully down the road. Well, the Morgan Francis property, I know that's an ongoing process. and. I guess uh, Deep will be getting their work soon, but I guess uh, we won't see the use of it for a couple of years. How about shading at Short Beach Picnic or any, anything new on that, Amy? I, I talked with our rep about, you know, the shade structures and stuff down there. We had put in for kind of bigger structures, but I asked them to scale it down to smaller structures, maybe near like some benches or some of the iron benches because, because it's on a beach and because it's susceptible to hurricane, it really has to be anchored more than just a park. So it the costs are just there. So I'm working on the updated pricing and they updated, you know, shade structure locations. Once I have that, I could present that to you probably next meeting um, if that's okay. Do those tables have holes in the middle where umbrellas could be used? Um, again, you've got to kind of be careful with umbrellas being that it's on a beach. They would have to be taken down and up every single night. Yeah. Uh, they have kind of this like these sail type ways where there's breaks in them. So the wind could pass through them. So they were, they were kind of looking at those shade structures compared to a fixed umbrella. All right, whatever you can find for us, thanks. Yeah, Chad, not a problem. Chad, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Can you stop sharing? Sure. I don't know right. how to do that. What right. do I do? Where it says, so you see where it says mic, camera, and screen? Just toggle oh, the yeah. screen. You got it right there. Thank you. You got it. No problem. Good. Okay. Nice. All um, right. Anybody have any new business? All right, if not on old business, we've got the request for a basketball court at Stratford Academy. Have you uh, looked into that at all, Chad? No, that's the first I've heard of it. I can talk about that, uh, Bill. That was me that brought that up because I was the Stratford uh, Academy principal who asked me about it. Yeah. And I asked him he's got to go through, uh, you know, the Board of Ed 
and that's got to be like a CIP thing, but mostly I think it has to come through the Board of Ed. I don't know. Chad, do you know how the Worcester ones were redone and the Lordship one was run? Is that Was that our CIP or was that Board of Ed? Uh, that's a good question, Amy. I'm not sure. I don't know if it's Board of Ed or if it was Public Works. I'm not sure. It was it was town. It was town. Yeah. So I'll I'll send a note to Renee and see if we could um, put it on there uh, on the CIP. Right. Amy, are they thinking a new structure? Or are they thinking about taking one of the tennis courts and transitioning it into a basketball court? Just taking one of the tennis courts. Because remember over the summer, I put my hoops out there for camp. Yeah. And then yep. he asked me to leave it there. So it's still there. My hoop is still over there. Um, yep. And nobody uses that tennis court really anymore. It's kind of just sitting there. So I don't have a problem with it. And, and I think that costs obviously to transition the courts and the blacktop because the blacktop is in pretty good shape. It just maybe repainted to basketball. Right. Um, the only people that I know that used to use it, you know, years ago, they used to do lessons there, but now they go to Short Beach again, which was great. And then there were some street hockey guys that used it like early in the year if there was no snow in the wintertime and stuff like that. But I don't even think they're around. I don't think we've had no, a request I think for that in a while. The long. last time I talked to those guys was pre-COVID. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if the existing structure is there, because to create a new structure, it's pretty tight on that property. So. That would be, you know, I could get quotes or we could see if we could render it to a basketball area. Right. And I don't think it has to be a major overhaul. Just uh, go with, with what's there and just improve it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. All right. Now, with the spring coming up, there's still the issue of the batting cage at DeLuca. Any um, updates, Amy, on that thought I had about the Babineau batting cage? Yeah, I was told um, that they still use that batting cage. Okay. Uh, yeah, Bill, that's, that's tough. I mean, you can't really move that cage because it's in the ground in concrete and all that stuff. So you would basically have to knock all the concrete off of it and then start from scratch, which I don't think there's going to be an installer that's going to want to do that. So, you know, I know Gary had said that he had uh you know gary from Stratford high said that he had either the netting or the poles in the netting so i mean i could visit with him again and then look and then the only place that's you know suitable other than where it was if the museum if the breakup museum is going to go on the grass pad area in the parking lot where the batting cage was the only next logical place for the batting cage would be on the grass field um, along the first base you know towards the back um, in the fenced in area or near the, the home run fence or, you know, wherever they would want it somewhere on the grass area, you know, so that it's neat and tidy and out of the way. Um, there's no really other place to put it other than in that area, which then, you know, not that men play there, but it would be completely not used for men's softball anymore. So you would have just an area that you're maintaining as grass that would never be used as a full field anymore. Yeah, Gary has, he told us last time that Gary has just the net. He has a, like a, a almost brand new net. And what, what he needs, I guess, from, from us or from the town or whatever, uh, is the poles, just a support system for the, for the net. And Bill, remember the reason that we were looking into this was because Stratford softball is the only one of the four high school teams that doesn't have an outdoor batting cage. You know, Pinnell baseball, softball have it, and Stratford baseball has it. So Stratford, Stratford softball is the only one that still doesn't. So they have the net. Um, they, they just need the poles. So I don't know, do we have, like, those kind of poles, Chad, or could we use any type of poles? This, this is like a temporary thing. It doesn't have to be permanent, right? It, I mean, it, it depends on what he had. It could be permanent or it could be temporary. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll catch up with Gary. And see if he has some information and specs on it then i can get with our fence contractor and see if there's a way that we could develop it and how much the cost would be other than just going out and buying another set or a traditional batting cage i'll do some legwork and research and see how much you know what we could do that way and chad the other the other reason i brought up the temporary part of it is um i know they're going to put that uh, the joan joyce museum and all that stuff and it's going to go where the old batting cage was 
um, would it be possible to put a temporary structure where the old batting cage was in that little grass area behind the left field line there? It's a great question. It just really depends on how anchored we have to have the poles to support the net. You know, I don't know if it could just be foldable poles, tri poles, if they actually have to go into the ground. Um, I'll ask Mike and see if he has any any insight on it as a fence guy to how what it would take to hold it up, you know, for wind and all of that stuff, even temporarily. And then we could see if it could be put in that area, then we could try it. You know, if not, there's, you know, you have tons of grass area out on the field that it could go into. All right. Did you ever have a chance to meet with Gary down there yet? I didn't. No. Yeah. And the tryouts and practice start when? About two weeks? Yeah, March 11th. Oh, that's soon. Yeah. Chad, do you have his email or his phone number? I do. I have both. I have his, okay. I've, I've talked to him many times about it. We've just never really gotten on the same page just because of, well, number one, what it's going to take to erect it, even temporarily, and then location, about picking a location, but you can't use that location, try a different location. You know, so it's just been, now that we have something ironed out, at least plan-wise, then we can figure out what the specs are needed and then we can move on from there. If it can't go in the parking lot because it's a more permanent temporary structure, then we'll put it out in the outfield. You know, we'll, we'll make it work. And even the location where it used to be could probably be used for now. I'll, I'll talk to Robbie Baird, but I don't think it's going to happen real soon with the uh, museum. It's something they're still researching to try and decide whether to go build something or to use a uh, a shed that you can buy a large shed trailer yeah i think that's going to be a long it's a great idea but it like you know they have to get permits and a lot of processes and committees to go through before any building starts so that's why i brought up maybe at least a temporary one for for this season but i mean you know if you want my honest opinion i think that i think the outfield actually works better because then you could go from where the home team is or, you know, the home team is what on third base or first base side, first base side, right? Or third base. Uh, third base. Break gets are always yeah. on third base side. I don't know about the high Yeah, school. I mean, we could put it on the third base side too, so that it's a shorter walk compared to walking outside of the complex to the top of the hill, um, you know, so that it's more cohesive for practice and all of that stuff. So yeah, we'll take a look third. at it. We'll yeah, see. the home team's on the home team's on the third base side, so maybe yeah, keep. So I mean, if we go third, we could put the temporary structure on the third base side too, and then make it more accessible off of field level, you know. But well, I'll talk with Gary and let's see what it takes to to erect the net on what you know what that does, and then that'll help us tell tale on a location. All right. All right. All right. Anybody have anything else? If not, our next meeting will be Thursday, April 6th at 6 p.m. And let's hold off on whether it'll be virtual or live. I know there's many would like to go live, but I'll talk to Aileen about that. Well, when it gets when it gets warm, we can start those outdoor meetings, Bill. I think a lot of people enjoy those too. Yeah, I, definitely. Although April usually April will probably be colder than February was. <laughs> it's just the way things go. Could be. All right, I guess uh, Rick and Paul, you guys ready? I'll I'll make the motion to uh, adjourn. Okay, I unmuted. I'll second then. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Thanks for your help, Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you. Meeting adjourned at six fifty-four <laughs> p.m. Thanks, everybody. I know. Number one. Let's go, Rick.